Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our uh, discussion forum. What does it mean to be European? Uh, today uh, we are, have a long uh, session, three, uh, three in-depth debates on different aspects of European identity. Uh, my name is uh, Arto Aniluoto, and I work as the Secretary General for the European Movement in Finland. And uh, this uh, event is organized uh, together with uh, three of our European partner organizations, uh, the European movements in uh, uh, Ireland, Slovenia and Albania. So all our uh, foreign guests, uh, welcome again. <coughs> Uh, and uh, this uh, event will act as the kickoff seminar of our joint uh, project called Campaign Europe, where we try to uh, create uh, European identity, especially uh, in focus of the upcoming elections of the European Parliament uh, next year. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, being the European Year of Citizens 2013, we have been hosting a, a, a wide array of uh, different uh, citizens' debates and discussions and also been engaging other actors in society and the media and uh, got a quite good response also, I would say. Because we believe in, in the European movement that uh, the European Union, though complex and bureaucratic and dull it may be at times, uh, is uh, too important to be left only for professionals. So we need also active uh, uh, citizenships, uh, citizens' uh, dialogue and, and, uh, and things like that. And today we have the, uh, the unique opportunity, you might say, to have uh, uh, three uh, big debates, each taking one hour and uh, 15 minutes uh, on, on three different uh, issues that uh, belong to the, under the umbrella question of what does it mean to be European. Uh, and uh, they will also, this, uh, this event is also uh, recorded, so it will be also available later online and will be used as a material for, for all of our uh, project partners. The, uh, the project is funded by uh, the European Commission and its uh, Europe for Citizens program. Uh, however, the Commission does not uh, take responsibility for the content of this uh, seminar or program. Everybody represents uh, just uh, themselves. Uh, and uh, uh, I, know, I don't know if you have all been uh, familiarized with the details of the program and our three uh, debates, uh, but the first debate is uh, why are nations uh, so special? Uh, the second one uh, will be on the topic of uh, borders of Europe and the third one, uh, why should European identity be constructed? And for each, uh, uh, each debate we will have uh, <coughs> a, 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 an expert of one of our uh, campaign, uh, um, our sister organizations uh, in Europe uh, and then two experts on the subject and then uh, moderated by a Finnish uh, journalist uh, who is interested in, in the same uh, 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 European identity is as fundamental a question as there could be when thinking about the operations of the European movement. However, it is a topic that we are very seldomly uh, have uh, organized a seminar on, or we have too seldomly had the chance really to get into this matter. What does it really mean that we are Finnish? What does it mean that uh, we are European? What, what is this constructed of? Uh, being a student of, uh, originally a student of social sciences and, and history, I have learned that uh, uh, most national identities and also European identities are in fact constructed. They are something we have been taught and we have been learned. Somebody has intentionally created them. Uh, and therefore they are also subject for criticism and discussion. Uh, and not, not as fixed things as some would uh, say. And if we think ourselves as what, is, what does it mean to be European, we can say that okay, Finland is geographically a part of Europe, we are now politically part of the European Union, this is a thing that can be debated more, but uh, I personally I have always believed that Europe is a mindset, uh, it is uh, 
those countries and people might consider themselves European who, who think that they share the common European values uh, which are humanist, egalitarian, democratic and I, I believe are one of the best export uh, one of the best uh, things we can export from Europe to other other countries and still uh, it's a thing that uh, you take model model from in, in, in developing countries when they are forming new political systems. But uh, since we have a lot of uh, experts and uh, three uh, interesting debates coming up, uh, I won't uh, say more, this was just my quick personal opinion on the subject. Uh, and uh, before uh, we begin, I would, uh, already at this point, I would like to uh, thank especially our uh, coordinator for this uh, uh, entire campaign Europe project, uh, Nina Lindberg, who sits there. If you, uh, <laughs> if you sit, uh, we could give a sort of applaud to Nina already at this time for taking a lot of uh, preparation. And now, um, this again goes on and off, uh, or maybe I can't just use it. <laughs> so it is my privilege to then ask the first uh, panels, uh, panelists on this discussion. One, why are nations so special? And the participants are Mikko S. Lehtonen, professor of media culture uh, from the University of Tampere, Emilia Palonen, uh, uh, lecturer of political science from the University of Helsinki, and Neil Richmond, project manager Sorry. Policy Manager from the European Movement in Ireland and this uh, discussion will be hosted by Sami Sillanpa who is Foreign Editor at Helsinki Sanomat Newspaper. Welcome! to raise your comments and questions. Um, but let's uh, start with introducing our panelists um, who represent, present, who represent uh, different points of view on, on this topic. Um, Neil, you come from Ireland, uh, involved in the movement for Europe. Um, could you introduce yourself and say what, what is your special interest in this topic? Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for having me here. It's very close. In Helsinki, and particularly in this venue. As uh, our chair has said, my name is Neil Richmond. I'm the policy and projects manager with European Movement Ireland. European Movement Ireland, much like European Movement Finland and Albania is an and Slovenia, is an independent, not for profit uh, agency looking to deepen the connection between Ireland and the EU. We work across the sectors with businesses, academics, non-governmental organizations, the full range to really get in touch with Irish people, to explain to them our role within the EU and the concept of what Europe is. Um, understandably, Ireland, much like Finland, has a strong history of nationalism. Um, we also received our independence in the early parts of the 20th century from, some would argue, 700 years of colonial rule. But that has shaped not only our national psyche, but also our relations with the EU. And that's something I'd like to explore in a bit more depth this afternoon. All right. Nicole Anton. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, my name is not Mikko S, but it's just Mikko. I, but okay. I seem to have a double identity, and that suits me well, Sorry. because that's also, in a way, my uh, role in, in this dis discussion. Let me start with uh, an anecdote. When Finland became a uh, member of the EU, there was this uh, joke uh, going around in uh, Brussels, uh, saying, uh, how do you tell uh, apart the extrovert Finn from an introvert Finn? And the reply was, of course, somebody knows this, uh, an introvert Finn, when discussing to somebody else, with somebody else, is watching his own shoes whereas the extrovert is looking at the shoes of, of the other. And so this is the national stereotype, we are introverts. And my problem with Finnishness is that I'm an extrovert, and uh, that's why I quite often feel like being in a foreign country when I'm 
when I'm in, uh, in, in my own country. On the other hand, I know very well this nationalist history, not least because uh, three generations in, in my family before me were school teachers uh, in countryside, and they were exactly teaching this nationalist ideology. Whereas my role seems to have been kind of a, a deconstruct this whole thing uh, my ancestors built. And uh, here, uh, I think it's enough to mention a book I published uh, with a couple of colleagues uh, nine, years, nine years ago, 2004, titled in English, Finland in Other Words, Suomi Toisin Sanoen, which, which was uh, kind of a, an essay trying to rethink what does it mean uh, to be a Finn in a globalizing world. Thank you. Emilia yeah. Palo, a political science researcher at the University of Helsinki. Thanks, Lord. Thanks for inviting me here as well. I'm really happy to be here talking about Europe and Europeanness. Um, I feel quite strongly uh, European, in fact, because uh, I've been living in uh, different parts of Europe and educated in uh, the UK for, for my university studies. I did them in London and Colchester in England. Um, but I also studied Hungarian politics and I spent quite a lot of time in Hungary in the late 90s and, and the 2000s. And I just come from there uh, on a conference trip. And as uh, Mikko's been uh, telling these jokes, I want to tell you a little anecdote uh, from Hungary. My colleague there who's teaching politics uh, at the university asked his students, uh, whom of you feels like a European? And the response was not like no show of hands or uh, not like a couple of hands uh, emerging. It was straight out laughing. <laughs> so people feel differently about being European. And uh, what I would want to be um, discussing is uh, how national identities and European identities, local identities, they are all kind of uh, multi-layered. And we have to think about the multi-layeredness of this. I'm a researcher in, at the university, but um, if you want to see, see something about um, my reflections on European ident identity, you can go online and see this web page, uh, euflagmemorial.wordpress.com, where um, I invited Romanians um, to um, draw or construct their own EU flags in 2007, when they joined the EU, when CDU was the cultural capital of Europe, uh, they were quite different answers to that question. What is the EU? And I can't wait to get a chance to do that again. Thank you, Emilia. Um, to get started with the discussion, uh, I'd like to remind us of a little bit of uh, European history. Um, as you all know, for centuries, Europe has been a continent that's been fragmented. Uh, it's been a fragmented combination of peoples, languages, cultures, nations. And every now and then there's been an attempt to join forces and, and, and form a larger union. Um, in history we've had uh, the Frankish Empire, we've had the, the Holy Roman Empire, um, now, of course, we have a European Union. Um, but for nations, it's always been a question of um, distinctive national identity, but also a question of whether we belong to something larger than our nation. Um, in this historical context, um, Neil, could you characterize the Irish nation state? What are the distinctive characters of? About. That question could lead to many answers not suitable for a forum like this. Um, and one I'm reminded about every time I go abroad. I even had a drink in the Dubliner bar here last night, and that seems to be the outside characteristic of Ireland, unfortunately, that a lot of people t think about when they think about Ireland. You know, the idea of Irishness and the Irish nation and the Irish nationality like, in my opinion, many other nationalities, is an emotional one. It's very much based in what you know, what you see around you. You support the national football team, you speak a certain language, 
and as uh, Arthur was referring to us, the small circles in society, when you're an Irish person, you go abroad and you meet another Irish person, it usually takes two other introductions until you know someone. You, you have a friend in common, or often a family member in common. I don't think, like, that's not uniquely Irish, but it really makes up the backbone of what we see as the Irish nation state. It's that commonality, the community. And in one way, it allows Irish people to be so instinctively pro-European. Um, recent poll put 86% of Irish people are still in favour of Ireland being a member of the European Union because we believe in the strength of community. Yes, there's divisions in community, and on our island more divisions than we care to remember, but that does not mean you cannot come above that for a very simple <coughs> kind of cause. Thank you, Neil. Um, Mikko, um, as you pointed out, um, you sometimes feel foreign in, in Finland. Uh, could you cl clarify a little bit more on that? Uh, on what is the sort of common identification of, of being Finnish and how you see it differently? First of all, uh, when you were talking about Irishness, uh, I could say the same about Finnishness. I, I think the national self-image is more or less the same. Uh, but about Finnishness, uh, as uh, you openly said, said that all identities are constructions, and of course, this is, uh, in, a, in a way, uh, uh, my problem with, with Finnishness, that there's something that's culturally produced, but then it's, uh, depicted and talked about as it was something ahistorical, as it was something natural. And uh, my famous example of this is actually the Euro coins. If, if you look at the Euro coins, what they have on, on the flip side, uh, whereas other countries have buildings and, and men's heads, in Finnish Euro coins you have uh, flowers and birds. So Finland is kind of a place that uh, it, where people are uh, thinking that we are very near the nature, we are natural, so we are not specific at all. We are like the general humanity, in a way. And, and this is uh, very pro problematic. Uh, to begin with, nationalism as an ideology is of course cosmopolitan. So the ideas of Irishness, of Finnishness, or, or Albanianness, or Romanianness were not in, in, in invented in these countries. The idea of nationalism was invented more or less in Germany, and then it was uh, exported and imported uh, to other countries. And it's, it's quite shocking. Uh, once you go to, for instance, uh, the national art museums, let's say in Tallinn or Bucharest in Romania, you're like, bloody hell, these people uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century, these uh, Estonians and Romanians, uh, these national romantics, they were Finns. Because it's, it's exactly the same uh, same uh, I imagery that, that you find in, in these places. So this nationalism was a cosmopolitan international movement, and uh, the problem is that we forget that thing, how all this was uh, invented. Thank you. Emilia, would you like to follow up on that? Um, what is so special about the Finnish national state, nation state? Um, well, yeah, nothing really. <laughs> I mean, we we are learning uh, to believe that there is some things, uh, there are some things that are really special about us, and and that's the uh, interesting part, I think, to follow how these uh, national narratives and and um, our feelings are being constructed and what how they are being maintained and how they are being questioned. Like, for instance, if Finland is playing ice hockey and maybe even close to winning or wins the uh, world championships in uh, ice hockey, then uh, national feelings would be arising and we, we would kind of identify ourselves as Finnish through this, uh, these games and these players, our heroes. But it, then again, if we would be telling a story about great pe presidents uh, in the history of Finland, that would maybe resonate with some Finns. Like yes, uh, the memory of Urho Kekkonen or or um, uh, Koivisto or Ahtisaari, they would be like something that people would want to be uh, finding their Finnishness in. So it's 
we, we tell each other stories every day and at the newspaper office you, you obviously do that as well. <laughs> you you um, uh, reconstruct and uh, re-articulate our self-image as things. Uh, so, so there's nothing necessarily uh, there's nothing given that would be finished but then we end up believing in these narratives and some of them become more important <coughs> than others uh, but they become kind of um, um, all together they turn into this kind of an empty signifier <coughs> or, or some sort of commonality that even if we tell each other different stories about Finnishness uh, we would still all believe together that there is something like Finland and I believe that is basically the same way as I in which uh, European identity building should would operate. You want to comment? I can continue from that. Uh, I think every decade uh, during the last 50 or so years, there's, there's been a popular vote on who is the Finn of all times in Finland. And the winner has always been one man, Gar Gustav Enil Mannerheim. And I've, I've always wondered, why is this guy voted to be the Finn of all times? Because this guy, first of all, belongs, belonged to the Swedish-speaking minority, and not only that, was member of the very thin Finnish uh, aristocracy, the genteel class coming from, from a manor, uh, from a rich family, who then went to be the uh, officer in uh, the, the Russian Tsar's army, and who, among other things, was... Uh, ethnologist in uh, Asia and when he uh, retired from being the president for a short while went to die in Switzerland so what's what's the what was the finishness of, of, of this guy and yet in some strange way he's time and again voted to be the Finn of all times okay. um, often nationalism uh, is considered, at least at its worst, uh, as being something against something else. If you're a nationalist, if you're a, a Finn, you can't be something else. It's, the idea is kind of exclusive. Um, however, in real life, I think the identity of people um, consists of several elements, and uh, nationalism doesn't necessarily uh, follow the borders of, of, of a nation. Um, I think Ireland would be a good example in that as, as a nation, Irish people have always survived by being international and also adverse times of the economy always uh, gone abroad. Um, however, maintaining your own identity, um, national feeling. Um, these ideas are not necessarily contradictory. What do you think, Andy? No, I, I don't think so. Um, Ireland as a nation, the Republic of Ireland, has a population of about 4.2 million. And then, of course, remembering the other part of the island, Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK, has a population of just over 1 million. So all in all, just over 5 million on the island. 72 million people globally identify themselves as Irish. So when you only have five million of those on a small island on the edge of Europe, it has to, you have to ask, well, why are we in those other centers? How have we retained our identity? And is that identity the same abroad as it is at home? There's great Irish population centers in the US, in Canada, and Australia, and the UK. There is much smaller ones on continental Europe and then spread across the rest of the world, but they are there. And often, what the people abroad see, that, see as being Irish is not necessarily what we see at home. Maybe because they had to leave in times of economic peril. And one of the greatest problems we found when the troubles were happening on our island up until the 90s was the money for the paramilitaries was coming from the US. The arms for the paramilitaries were coming from the US. The support for the paramilitaries on the entire island of Ireland was single figure percentage. No one wanted it. Yet, there was huge millions and millions of euro, then pounds, of money and weapons and coming from the US and Canada into Ireland. And then much closer to home, into the UK. So we're dealing with this internal and external battle. That those who see themselves as Irish abroad are in a way out of step from those who see themselves as Irish at home. And then when it comes to Europe, 
as I mentioned, 86% of Irish people are pro-European. But when you go and talk to the Irish community in the UK or the US, it's much smaller. So it is at a step, and it is a, a huge challenge to, well, what's the big overarching thing that unites us as an identity? Is it some fantasy dream of Ireland in the 1940s when we drank Guinness and listened to music and danced at crossroads? And there's a saying, an Irishman supports the Irish football team first, and whoever is playing England second. Is that what we think of Irish? Or is it something a lot more simple? That it's the human nature. And that's why I feel strongly that any Irish person abroad has the ability to both get on and be friends at the same time that they can be get in a fight and be mortal enemies as well. Um, Miko, in Finland, um, under the current climate of debate, so to speak, um, for many people it seems to very difficult to feel both Finnish and feel European at the same time. Why is, why is it so difficult? I don't know. It's not difficult for me. I think it's not difficult for you. I think there are lot, lots of people who uh, become interpolated or, or talked to as both Europeans and, and, and Finns at the same time, more and more. But then again, uh, I think this is a question of the internal di divisions uh, uh, among the Finns. And I was thinking about this this morning, reading the newspaper you work, work with. Uh, there was this foreign co correspondent, X, uh, who is now a freelance, Ole Kivinen, who was once again writing about this. Why can't we be Europeans? And actually, reading the history uh, with the and this is the leading newspaper in the country. This comes from already the 30s. Uh, in the 30s, Hetting uh, uh, is to name the paper, was very pro-European, uh, kind of against uh, certain idea that, that was said uh, in, in Finnish is impivaralisus, like parochialism, uh, inwardness, and, 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 and things like this. And I think this still seems to be going on when uh, this paper uh, very strongly identifies with upward mobile uh, middle classes who uh, internationalize uh, and, and talks about them and talks to them. So us, I think I'm one, one of those uh, the paper tries to talk to, it's easy for us to identify uh, with, with all this and like uh, say questions concerning uh, multiculturalism, uh, like uh, migration, things like this, th these, uh, as a university professor, all this for me is just enriching my life. I live in Tampere and uh, within 10 minutes from my home I, I can eat Thai, Laos, I Indian, uh, Sri Lankan, you name it. Uh, it it's great for me. And there's not, not a professor from Somalia who's going to uh, occupy my, my office. Uh, but then there are lots of people uh, who don't feel it necessarily that way and, and this afternoon there's going to be a discussion about European populism and the old, uh, old uh, what, what's maintained is that quite often uh, such people who are the net losers of globalization t tend to, uh, tend to uh, uh, support populism but it, if you think of uh, Finnish populism that says that uh, you have to be first and foremost Finn it's not only a question of uh, like being against globalization or migration or things like that. Not only that, but it's also a question of like what kind of identifications uh, people have. Like what does it mean to be a good person? What does it mean to be a good thing? And not ev everybody, for various reasons, uh, uh, identify with these ideals that, for instance, the leading newspaper in the country uh, preaches. And uh, one thing that's very interesting in, in Finnish populism is, of course, uh, the fact that quite many male people vote and support uh, that phenomenon. And I've been thinking that we should think a couple of steps uh, backwards and, and think of how the cultural and so social system of Finland like to begin in, at schools. Uh, that the so-called official system that's saying, let's be European, uh, these people not necessarily find it very rewarding 
from the early stages of their life as males. And, and well, this is a much longer story, of course, and, but, and, and now, now this is like tabloid he headline, how I put it, but uh, I think we must rethink that way in order to understand uh, why some, some people find it rational to act as they do. Emilia, you've had the experience of living uh, in several European countries. Uh, looking from that experience, um, how do you see the discussion in, in Finland at the moment in terms of uh, Finnish identity and, and European identity? Well, I guess it's not very different, in fact. Um, now, I was also reminded about something that was uh, published in, in your paper to, <laughs> today about immigrants um, in the UK and, uh, and, and London trying to make their living there and, and so, uh, arguing that there are, there are always jobs there, unlike, unlike in the places where they would be coming from. Um, and uh, so, and the economic downturn has really this kind of an effect that um, a lot of people become uh, worrisome about their own futures and their own identities. And for many people in Finland and, and in other countries, uh, work somehow defines their identity. And if you if you lose that job, then you become um, quite you find yourself in a volatile position. And then uh, emphasizing a solid identification in something um, would be kind of helpful. You would find it helpful. And, and now these um, uh, sort of populist parties and also extreme right xenophobic parties that I think are the distinct phenomenon uh, in general in Europe, uh, they are offering uh, these uh, better, uh, sort of more solid identity, uh, identity basis. And there are not that many uh, alternatives either, because when you think about identities as multi-layered, then uh, what is being emphasized as the layer that you want to be focusing on is str uh, strategic. So for instance, uh, would one emphasize the local identity? Uh, currently in Finland, where we, where we discuss this um, reforms of the community um, law or this municipal, municipal law, then it makes sense for the government as well not to emphasize too much local identifications, but in emphasize instead even national uh, identification, the national problem of having to feed the future generations and take care of the elderly in the future. And that all kind of ties in nicely in a way with uh, nationalism and with the, with the sort of predominance of uh, Finnish identity in Finland and the majority identities in other countries. So I don't think that the, the people themselves are very different in these countries. I lived in Austria, which is of course famous for uh, the Jörg Haider's movement, and I was living there in the mid 2000s, and um, and that was also a regional movement to start with. It contested the authority of uh, Vienna, where consensus-based decision-making had been taking place for decades and the left and the right had kind of settled everything and not even t told the press about <laughs> these things or at least told them not to publicize uh, material about their internal debates among the elite. So it's not surprising that these kind of regional, first regional movements would be emerging and then they turn into um, also nationalist and xenophobic movements. Um, we can follow up on, on, on the nationalist, nationalist movement a bit, a bit later, uh, but I'd, um, I'd like to ask Neil about, um, uh, about Ireland, and um, as you mentioned, a majority of the Irish people are pro-European according to polls. However, however in, in the UK um, there's quite a different kind of debate going on, a lot of people feel that um, the UK should get out of the European Union altogether. What what explains these um, different attitudes? Um, and, you know, anyhow, there is a lot of shared history and, 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 and you know uh, behind it, behind you and the Yeah, it's it's in one way quite simple, but it will still take a while for me to give, I suppose, very much my personal opinion on it. 
what the European Union was all about when it started back in the 50s, a really simple thing was six countries who came together and didn't want to see another Second World War. Within the space, another generation had been wiped out by war. So they pooled their steel and their um, coal, the tools of war, in order to stop that. Really simple. There were six countries. The UK was asked to be part of it, but they didn't. And a large argument for that is down to national psyche. The six countries that t came together, Germany, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, it was all quite clear that they all lost in the Second World War. They lost many, many lives. They lost economic sovereignty. Their countries were devastated. But the national psyche in the UK, which then still saw itself as not just a superpower, but the superpower that had once had a colonial stretch across the globe, was that they won. They had the victory in Europe Day. They had the victory in Asia Day. The UK was on the winning side with the Soviets and the US. But it wasn't, practically. It may have emotionally won the war, but it was devastated economically. The Blitz destroyed London. It destroyed the industrial centres of Coventry, Birmingham. Millions or thousands upon thousands of British young men were killed, not just in Europe, but over in Asia and in Africa. But yet the British psyche, the, the stiff upper lip and the pre-existing class system, wouldn't let it go for that. Instead, we had Churchill and the royal family on the balcony in London celebrating a great victory. So why should we engage in Europe? That's just a club for losers. The UK is better than Europe. And that national psyche still exists. However, in the 1950s, Ireland was the complete opposite. We'd broken out of, as I said earlier, 700 years of colonial rule. We were fairly introverted. Our biggest export people used to think it's Irish beef or Guinness. No, it was our people, as we mentioned earlier. They were fleeing the country. So for Irish people, when Ireland first applied to join the EU or the EC in the 60s, we were defined as an island behind an island. We were hiding behind the UK. And without the UK, we could not be part of the EU. But yet the UK didn't want to join. And they had huge oppositions between the French and the Germans. So when Ireland and the UK and the Danes finally came into the European U uh, EC in the 70s, Ireland embraced it. They threw themselves into it. First and foremost, they've got lots of money. They've got money for agriculture, got money for regional funding. All of a sudden we were looking out, we were looking to trade with the outside world, whereas before we only traded either with ourselves or with the UK. But yet we go back to the British psyche as it's joining the EEC, its empire is crumbling. It's losing colony after colony in Asia and Africa. It's losing influence. The Soviets and the Americans are the superpowers. Good old Great Britain is now very much a second tier country and isn't a superpower. And that's why I feel it has never fully been able to embrace the European <coughs> concepts. What the first thing the British did when they joined the EEC was hold a referendum to leave it in 1975 to get new competences. So nearly from the outset, there's been an internal battle. Someone said when, when Thatcher had her, her big moment in Bruges saying she wouldn't give another penny to the, European, the EEC, someone said the reason Thatcher hates Europe so much is she didn't think of it first. And that is the pre-existing mindset that it's very, very difficult. And we work very closely with our, our European movements in the UK, but you'll have no overt pro-European party in the UK. You the Liberal Democrats who never get above 17, 18%. And even then, they temper it down. Tony Blair is seen as a great European. His first ever election pamphlet called for a British withdrawal from the EEC when he ran for election. And so that's supposedly the pro-European party in the debate at the moment. And the Tories were the ones who wanted to get into Europe in the first place because they wanted the trading links. But it's nearly cyclical, cyclical that whoever's in opposition will flip between being pro and anti-Europe. And that's that's going back to the concept mindset is that the UK, there will always be a significant portion of the UK who aren't only anti-Europe, but they are instinctively of the belief that the UK is too good for Europe. Michael. What I like about <coughs> the English and, and the UK as a whole is, 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 is uh, the ability to uh, ironize what one, oneself. Uh, this is not irony, but uh, I've seen a headline from the Times from uh, 1912. Uh, Fog in the Channel, continent isolated. <laughs> anyway, but uh, what Neil is uh, talking about uh, sp speaks of the relations between centers and peripheries. And speaking of Finland, 
we also have to think about this uh, center peripheral thing because it's it's quite crucial to uh, the national understanding of who we the Finns are, and it's. It's less than a hundred years when there was a huge debate about are Finns uh, Mongolians or not, Mongols or not, really. In the uh, 1910s and 1920s, there was this international idea that uh, genetically Finns are Mongols and a huge uh, intellectual movement to say, no, we are not Mongols. Kind of, so it, it's a negotiation. Uh, where do we come from, who we are? And it's quite interesting that uh, during the Finnish history there, there's been numerous various theories concerning uh, the genetic inheritance <coughs> of Finns. And uh, at some stage the idea was that yes, uh, genetics really show that we come from the uh, Urals. And after Finland became a part of EU, there were reports uh, that actually the Finnish genetic inheritance is exactly the same as any other North European. Uh, po population and now this is the official truth and always these truths uh, go hand in hand with the official political truths of, of the time but anyway centers and peripheries uh, uh, every time I walk through the Helsinki railway station I remember a book that's telling about uh, two guys sitting in the restaurant the railway station restaurant during the Second World War and discussing and uh, it's the title is exile dialogues in Finnish it, it's translated and the author is none other than the great German playwright Bertolt Brecht who was sitting during the war in that restaurant and talking and who then wrote this text and one of the great ideas of this text is that uh, one of these guys says that exile is the best school for dialectics. And this means that exile is a place where you learn to think relationally. When you are not where you were born, you see everything uh, simultaneously in light of two places, the place you come from and the place where you are. And in a way, this being in exile is uh, quite near the idea of being in, in a periphery, not being in a center. The center doesn't have to know anyone else but the center. But the periphery at least has to know uh, not only itself but also what's the relation to the center. And, and, and so, so, so this could be kind of a source of some kind of wisdom. Right. Well, to continue on that, um, as we speak right now uh, in Ukraine, in, in Kiev, there's an interesting um, protest going on, as you've probably seen in, in the news. Uh, thousands of people in central Kyiv are protesting and shouting slogans like we love the European Union and waving the EU flags, uh, which is something you don't see in, in Europe too often these days. Um, but I guess for, for the Ukrainian protesters, uh, the question is very fundamental. Uh, where do we want to belong to? Uh, do we want to be part of the sort of a European family or as opposed, a European family as opposed to so-called Russian family? Um, to put it kindly. Um, uh, which is a very fundamental question and, and it also was a fundamental question for, for Finland at the time we decided on, on the membership of the, of the European Union. But now, with all these new problems of uh, economic downturn, immigrants, uh, European bureaucracy, everything that annoys us, have we forgotten the past and, and, and why we opted for European in the first place? Um, yes, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, um, Neil talked about the uh, peace that that was the basis for founding of the European Union. But equally, it was also about economics. Um, I've been studying Luxembourg at some point in my research career, and, and it, it, it is a fascinating place because there you have not only uh, multilingual Luxembourg people, French and Luxembourgish speaking, but there are also Italians living 
in uh, multiple generations that moved uh, the uh, they originally moved there in the 50s and then there's another group of immigrants Portuguese from the 70s and neither of these had got a uh, right to vote in the local elections in Luxembourg it's something that European uh, Union member states do they opt out of certain things they have their own kind of privileges for this and that thing and in Luxembourg it was uh, the question about not letting the immigrants vote so only having that uh, that right for the um, Luxembourgish and they became active in the trade union movement instead it also goes to saying that the basis of European uh, integration was economic prosperity and I think at the moment uh, because of the economic downturn we are maybe forgetting that side too um, it's kind of too easy to say well we don't need EU if we, we are not uh, prosperous enough at the very moment and, um, and on that basis uh, argument against the, the existence of the European Union which m might become a big issue uh, after the next European elections, if the populist uh, parties would be, and the Eurocritical parties would be getting a large representation at the European Parliament. But the other thing about the European Union is of course that it's uh, quite elite-led project. It was never about the citizens of Europe. It, it was never about these people that are now protesting in Kiev and, and their possibilities uh, and, and there's the sort of freedoms and freedoms of movement. It is actually quite difficult for a European citizen to move about in the EU. They always ask me, I mean, I, I, I know this from experience, like, where do you come from and where are you going? So it, it's always assumed that you're coming from your native country and you're going to work in another one. That, uh, and then going back to your native country, never like doing these um, trips like uh, somebody who was interviewed at the Helsinki Sanoma uh, today, who had come from uh, Romania um, to Spain and then moved on after 12 years to London. Um, and that is kind of a reality for some Europeans. But it was um, even though immigration and cheap labor from the South European countries to, to the uh, Benelux countries was the idea behind, one of the ideas behind European integration. Uh, we kind of forgotten about um, the, uh, the real issue, the, the freedom of movement for citizens and freedom of them, for them to actually participate in the democratic processes in the EU. So now with this uh, democratic deficit that has, has actually been talked about for quite a few decades already in the EU, uh, there's more and more questions being raised like where did we join? I mean, what is this? What is this community after all? I mean, is, is it actually about us? And uh, it's, it would be too easy to answer no, it was never about you. Um, and I would hope that um, it would be taken further to a direction where people could be identifying with this and having by, by having uh, power uh, to um, introduce even changes in the EU and, and that the process of decision making was made more transparent uh, especially thinking about the lobbying and then the third thing about the prosperity for the normal Europeans um, now that I'm still on my rant, uh, I want to be inviting us to think about something like um, the social security in Europe. That is something that is quite divisive um, within, within Europe. And now, um, precisely these immigrants in the UK who, who are accused of coming to work, uh, not to work here, but just use the social security, we could think about more like having a Europe-wide basis for social security that would then uh, tell something more substantive also about Europe, uh, where we want to be turning Europe into what kind of 
um, uh, what kind of uh, community or what kind of um, organization of cooperation that's basically what, what it would be about right Miko briefly and uh, tell me give the power to the people finally power to the people uh, the title of these discussions is uh, what does it mean to be a European and before we give power to the people I'd like to say something about that uh, I mean what's the Europe is it the state of mind or what, what is it? Uh, quite often when historians r r write about the idea of Europe, they say that uh, it, it's more or less, less the same as uh, Christendom or Christianity. And, and that's way to th think, one way to think of it. But if you think of today's Europe, uh, how can you say that? Think of today's Germany, for instance, huh? how big part of Muslims uh, of, of the population there are. Uh, Europe is uh, notoriously uh, bad uh, or difficult to define geographically when compared to, say, Australia or uh, South America or, or a Africa. So, what's Europe? Uh, and why I'm talking about this is that actually when we talk about European civilization, uh, the problem is that the European civilization has been built in exchange with other civilizations. Think, for instance, uh, the alphabetic writing. Always the historians say that the alphabetic writing was invented in classical Greek, Greece. And it was, but it was invented on the Phoenician model. The Phoenicians already had alphabetical writing. The Greek only added the vowels, and, and that was it. So it came from, from, from Mideast. Uh, or think of uh, how did the classical Greek philosophy uh, stay alive during the Middle Ages. Uh, it was brought to Europe by Arabs by that time. So without this exchange with the Islam or Arab civilization, Europe wouldn't be the Europe it is. And, and that, that's something we have to keep his historically in mind. I could go on for long, but as some is said, brief, so I'll just uh, give you these glimpses. Um, thank you, Miko. We will continue the discussion with our panelists uh, pretty soon, uh, but because we don't want Europe to be a group of boring talking heads, uh, we will now. Are we boring? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we will now, now involve uh, the audience. Uh, you will get the uh, the chance to use your freedom of speech, uh, as being which is something we value in Europe. Um, so please use your um, blue and orange pa paper. Um, there's going to be a very simple question, and I hope you uh, everybody get an answer. Um, the question is: Do you identify yourself as a European? Blue for yes. But blue for yes. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, some people seem to have kind of a divided identity. Uh, most people seem to be feel some themselves European. Um, can I ask someone, someone who raised the blue flag? Um, uh, can I ask somebody to comment on, on why the blue flag and what does it mean to you? Is a lady there? Me? You, you want to say something? Well, I want to say, yeah, well, definitely I feel like an European, especially when I'm out of the borders in Europe. So I then, specifically, I feel very strongly that I'm European. Not in my everyday life here in Finland, I'm not thinking that I'm European. Okay, maybe you got this by now. Actually, that's it. So. <laughs> Could you repeat it? Could you repeat? I, feel, okay. I think most people didn't hear you. Okay, so I said that when, especially when I'm out of the borders from Europe, in the States or outside Europe, then it, I feel it very strongly that I'm European. And I'm proud of that, sort of. I'm proud to say that, yeah, I'm European. Um, I might introduce myself as being Finnish, but definitely European comes along with that. That's what I wanted to say. Right, thank you for that comment. Um, at the back row there, there were some people who raised the orange 
uh, flag. Uh, could I ask you to comment on, on why do you not feel European? No? Okay. Well, uh, I saw some people who raised both orange and blue. Somewhere there, maybe? Would you like to add something on? on the identity issue, please. Right, okay, well let's... I can take a comment. Oh uh, yeah, sure, okay, please go ahead. Bring your mic. Hello? So, just to comment, her reasons for, for uh, feeling European is when she's outside and traveling, for instance, and I perhaps feel that when in when inside Europe, I feel quite strongly European because I've been moving inside Europe a little bit and it's always, of course, been um, a challenge to identify with a new country and so on. So perhaps for me, it's not so much an experience when outside, but actually when I'm inside, when I feel yeah. Right, thank you. Well, you will get your chance to comment and ask a bit later, but let's move on with our panelists now. Um, Mika, do you want to follow up? I, I just want to comment the voting. I had this both, and uh, in retrospect, I should have had this because, first and foremost, I think I feel uh, myself to be the citizen of uh, the world, and not first and foremost the European. So, maybe some of you who have had this, it, it, it's not only a question between the national identity and the regional or aerial identity, but also the question of. Uh, the area and, and the whole globe. Okay, and our chairman would like to comment something on this. <laughs> I voted for uh, a European, but I want to comment these levels because I've often found that uh, the thing, uh, the things that you said in the audience, uh, I feel the same way in that uh, where I come from depends on where I am. Uh, if I'm in Helsinki, I can say that I come from Serka, and everybody understands. If I go to Lapland, I'm automatically coming from Helsinki. Uh, when I go to Brussels, uh, I'm, I'm from Finland. That's uh, clear to everybody. They would know the uh, places. If I go to South America, like you said, you go in the States, they have no idea where Finland is or what that is. Uh, even then I say I'm from Europe. And we can go on like... Uh, like uh, you said that uh, you are first and foremost from the from the world. That if uh, if ma if there would be life in our space uh, found anywhere, you would say that. Uh, and when you go went to visit, that I come from the world or the earth. So I've always uh, felt that these are like different levels that uh, uh, that interact with with the uh, with the context of where you come from. Okay. Can I comment on that as well? I mean. Uh, as I've been living in, in all these different countries, Austria, Germany, um, or Eastern Germany as well, <laughs> uh, Hungary, UK, and uh, I've spent quite a few weeks in the US as well, I feel, I feel that I've lost some of my soul, that's how people say it often, or then gained some for my soul by being in those places, so that, that actually has an effect on my identity. So when I came back here in, in Finland like on a more permanent basis in 2007, I definitely felt like a former expatriate Finn. So I didn't, feel, uh, I, I didn't feel that Finnish, I felt everybody else felt more Finnish around me than, than I was feeling, because I didn't know what, I don't know, the current popular people, uh, um, or, I don't know, singers or playwrights would be, and, um, and I, I felt sort of uh, half a pin. <laughs> but also, uh, in all these new places that I have been uh, living, I didn't feel completely as a local either. So I think we gained um, a lot of things for our audiences, and I think what Neil said was really important and interesting that uh, you might end up living in, in some sort of a, you, your Finnishness or Irishness uh, or even Europeanness could be something quite different 
when you have been living outside of that place for a long time? Mm. Well, in, in discussion, nationalism and Europeanism are often put against each other. But Neil, do you think there could be some similarities in these two ideas? To an extent, um, to be honest, it's really difficult to feel European without feeling Irish or Finnish or German first or equal. And there's very few people who will get really excited, paint their face blue, wave a flag <laughs> when the European Ryder Cup team beats the US in golf. Because in my opinion, I'm pretty sure that's the only sport that Europe as a whole competes together. It's not soccer. It's not ice hockey, correct me if I'm wrong. It's not any of the main sports. And there's an easy emotional attachment to nationalism through sport. And it happens especially in the Olympics. Things like that. That's how you, you even though it's an individual athlete winning the gold medal, you feel that you've a little bit of ownership of them because you've gone down to the pub, bought a beer, and watched them on the TV and draped yourself in your national flag. I've never met anyone outside of Brussels whoever has done that about the EU. Plenty of people outside the EU have done that who aren't in the EU because they think the EU is the answer. So to come back to the question, I think you can absolutely feel very patriotic, not necessarily nationalist, but definitely patriotic and European at the same time. And in order to be truly European and proud of a European identity, you really need to be proud of your own identity first. Well, what, have is, what we have seen in Europe in, in last years um, is a steady rise of um, nationalistic populist movements. We've seen in several countries, including Finland. Um, I, I'd like to you know, go a bit into the reasons. Uh, why do you think why this phenomenon is happening right now? Neil. It, it, it's an easy phenomenon. In times of crisis, it's easy to become extreme. And in times of crisis, it's easy to blame the establishment for all your problems. And therefore, what is the ultimate establishment but the European Union? As was mentioned earlier, it's not a bottom-up movement. It is very much a top-down movement that was decided by political leaders 50, 60 years ago. And even all the treaties are debated by political leaders today. Ireland, for a difficult constitutional reason constantly has to vote on European referenda and on European treaties. Even though we have an 86% um, of our population are positive towards the EU, we still consistently reject European treaties because it's a kick against the establishment. And the extreme kick against an establishment is to go for an extreme party, especially for a nationalist party. You know, your welfare payment gets cut, you blame a foreigner, you blame the establishment, you shave your head, you go out and march. You know, you're stuck in an economic desperate situation, you blame someone else, you go extreme. And it's not necessarily extreme right, it can be extreme left and anti-EU, anti-globalization as well. And that's why I was watching the news last night and they had pictures from uh, the Ukraine of the protests. And one thing that confused me was I kept seeing the anarchist flag amongst the EU flags in the protest. I gotta, gotta think, like, the complete opposite to anarchism is the bureaucracy and conform of the EU. Um, while that, a lot of people say, well, that's why the EU is so boring, it's the boring things that make life work. Emily? Um, yes, I think Neil is quite right in that, that the uh, populist vote is, is definitely not just about uh, nationalism itself, but also about this anti-elite feeling and, and the uh, response to the elites. And Europe currently definitely doesn't give an alternative to that. I mean, um, that, that sort of, um, it's hard to, hard to persuade somebody who's uh, fed up with the elites to actually start believing in Europe and uh, the EU of today. Uh, but I can, can see though that uh, in Ukraine they, they would be uh, seeing 
EU as a source of freedom. That's what a lot of uh, countries felt before they joined the EU. <laughs> and that's, that was the feeling that I encountered um, in, in some of the places in Sibiu, in Roma uh, Romania, where I uh, staged my EU flag memorial project. I mean, some places it was I really interesting because in the center of the city, people were really excited about the whole whole EU flag and the, the membership in the EU, they had just joined uh, um, the EU that same year. And, and in uh, the places where kind of normal people, less educated people hung out in the local market, they were much more suspicious. Like, what is this? This person is coming here and she's got the EU flag. <laughs> this is something really, really suspicious. So, so yes, um, the, the story that we have, have been telling about uh, the EU and European identity has not really reached all European citizens in, in the first place. And it, there are good reasons for that, which we all have already talked about. But uh, when thinking about the possibility of the European identity to exist, um, the EU has tried um, through some means to construct the sort of Europe-friendly or European identity. And one of these was uh, the Cultural Capitals of Europe program that started in 89. And having gone through a lot of documentation and EU debates about this program, it's clear that in the beginning it was very much focused on a sort of uh, stereotypical uh, Europe, myth of Europe, like the first cities were Athens, Florence and Paris. Then it became a whole story about post 40s productions with uh, Glasgow as the model city for European <coughs> capital of culture. And it became about sort of tourism, it became about the place of Europe in the world, sort of, uh, making connections with, among Europeans to uh, invigorate some sort of a cultural scene that could be uh, selling products to people outside the EU. And then it became again kind of a dual thing about uh, constructing citizens and, and linking uh, European identity with the local identity precisely. So kind of stepping over the national identity to sort of uh, get rid of that layer because it would it, it seemed easier perhaps to communicate uh, sort of communalities between uh, sort of citizens and, and local and regional. Uh, identity and the European identity but there's a problem with this kind of program as well they don't have funding in these European capital of culture cities they receive one million uh, from the EU and it's conditional upon them running these programs that cost so much more I mean one million is only for maintenance of this office so they, they are totally dependent on national funding and they are dependent on uh, on sponsorships with uh, enterprises. So the EU doesn't even, I mean, they don't have means to uh, educate citizens to become Europeans or uh, persuade them to become uh, Europeans. So this is one of, the, one of the problems that I think we are facing. And, and in, in that sense, it's really easy for the populist parties to also argue against European because it's just the elite project. It's just for us who can move up Wrong. Yeah. Uh, two points. Uh, first of all, uh, I was thinking earlier during the discussion of, of this new phenomenon uh, that's called welfare nationalism. I mean, when welfare state was built in, 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 in Nordic countries and, and elsewhere, uh, it had a universalist idea that we must take care of everyone. And now, this, this welfare state idea is in a way turned against universalism, said that welfare must be for us, but not for them. So there's a big <coughs> contradiction in there. On the other hand, this whole idea of universalism, uh, like the human rights and, and uh, all men being equal, comes of course from the European in Enlightenment uh, tradition, which is very, very contradictory in, in many ways. But what's interesting is that uh, quite a many neo-nationalists use this kind of universalist enlightenment thought against 
then. For instance, uh, in, in Finland we have a very famous member of parliament, I mentioned his name, even though everybody knows it, Jussi Hallaho, uh, who uh, before, uh, well, I don't think he still has it, but before he had this, oh no, his subtitle for, for this scripta blog uh, that, that he's writing is uh, The Sunset of the West. And the idea of his texts, if you read them, is that actually the barbarians are at the gate and they uh, kind of uh, threaten the democracy and the enlightenment of, of the West. And uh, that's why we have to stop them. And I, w I would say that this is very much against the enlightenment idea. He's using the enlightenment idea against the ethos of the universalist uh, ideas of in enlightenment, and there's a big contradiction in that. Right, um, we've got about another 15 minutes to go. Um, before we give the floor to the audience, um, I'd like to take a last uh, question with the panelists. Um, continuing on the theme of um, populist um, movements, critical of the European Union or the European idea itself. Um, this question, of course, is very divisive in, in Europe at the, at the moment. Um, a lot of people who feel strongly for Europe are very worried or even in fear of the populist movements. Um, what should be done? Is a, a populist right-wing movement something that we should somehow stand you know, get, get stopped, um, um, and if so, what is the limit of acceptable political action and, and, and non-acceptable acceptable legal? The first thing I'd like to say uh, in relation to that is that uh, if you want to criticize something, the only condition on which you can really criticize it is that you must understand it. Understanding isn't the same thing as accepting, but in order to try to find out how, for instance, fight against something, you have to be, you have to have some kind of a uh, idea of what, what, what you're fighting against. And in here, I'd say, as a member of cultural elite, I would be very self-critical towards how the cultural elites have tried to fight against populism, because. Uh, for instance, I speak of Finland here. Uh, in Finland, it's always been a question of the elite preaching to the people. Uh, like before the Second World War, uh, actually what the elite preached was a form of racism or Russophobia, the, the fear of, of, of the Russians at, at that, that stage. Uh, when Finland became part of the EU, then there was a new kind of preaching which was uh, like please understand those who are different from yourselves. And this is the problem that we, uh, in general discussions we have two different uh, alternatives. First of all, we have so-called xenophobia, the fear of the other. And then the elite is saying, no, no, we must have xenophilia, friendliness towards the other, without at all thinking why some people become xenophobic, why for some people it seems to be quite uh, rational to act in a xenophobic way. So, the question is how to create uh, a third alternative, uh, which I call uh, xenosophia, the wisdom concerning the other. Understanding that uh, multiculturalism, if you talk, talk of this uh, branch of uh, this populist mov movement, uh, how they fight against multiculturalism, Multiculturalism isn't only paradise, it also has contradictions and, and collisions. And as long as elite says that, uh, or tr tries to uh, forget them, there's no way to uh, being, uh, for, for the elite members, that there's no possibility really to criticize and to change anything. Right. Um, Neil, do you want to continue on that? Yeah. <laughs> This can kind of be looked at in two ways. The first way is the challenge for the silent majority. Do they become unsilent? Do they say, well, hold on, we disagree with the populist movement, and maybe their rhetoric, their rhetoric, which is the rhetoric of the streets, is going to lead us down a very dangerous path, the results of which we can't even contemplate. 
But ultimately, in order to get that to happen, the elites, the so-called elites, especially when it comes to the European context, must start, must um, change the language of debate. Communications in all of this is key. The EU is the worst institution in the world for communicating why it is one of the best institutions in the world. It is a responsibility of very small organisations like ourselves in European Movement Ireland and Finland, Albania and Slovenia to go out and convince people. And we don't go out and write really in-depth academic articles or opinion pieces aimed at a certain elite. We try our best to get out into the schools. And when I say schools, I mean the kindergartens. I mean the 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year olds. Opponents to this, the populists will say, oh, we're looking to brainwash. And we're looking to inform. As was rightly said, you must understand it before you can complain. And if you understand that, you might want to get emotionally excited about the EU, but you do want a minimum wage, you do want the right to work wherever you want, wherever in the EU that you're able to, you want the right to go to university in a different country, you want the right to be able to own your own home, simple things like that, that you accept the EU and you embrace the EU. If you want the right to protest on the street and give out about everyone who isn't doing anything to you, you accept populism. And ultimately, what will that get you? It'll get you very angry, affect your blood pressure, and ultimately no change, okay? That doesn't mean you can't question the EU or the elites. That doesn't mean you can't change it. But you can't simply go into a negotiation looking for a fight. Sometimes you need to go in a little bit calmer, but in order that to happen, the elites, especially the European elites, need to change their language, need to make it a lot more simple, make it accessible. And maybe rather than focusing on small directives about you know, working times and soil conditions, we could explain that no, it's much, it's about the far broader strokes. It's about the simple things. It's about movement. It's about rights. And ultimately, it's about the money in your pocket. Right, Emilia, your last comment, please. Uh, thanks. I'd like to make um, sure that we don't necessarily equate populism with xenophobia, because this, um, not all populists, not all populist parties, or those who vote populist, are xenophobic. And, um, they may be voting uh, populist parties because of uh, protest, uh, populism in the understanding that I use it in um, uh, in the university as a as a researcher means more of like this building a movement uh, of a common front against uh, some sort of an enemy and I believe that some sort of populism not xenophobia but this other sort of populism is really important for any political movement or party so if we just build our political identities on the basis of rationalism and that this should be done in that way because it really is rational and uh, in debate uh, we are in trouble. This, is in a, this has been a problem with the EU. Uh, it's been quite often a problem with the national elites as well. <laughs> but it's, it's definitely a problem of the EU and in order to then um, challenge the situation, try to, we should learn from the populist movements. We shouldn't learn xenophobia, but we should learn what, uh, reasons why that emerges too. But we should especially learn about the democratic deficit and the reasons why people feel so uh, disenfranchised, even if they can go and vote on <laughs> certain days uh, every five years. Uh, the Euro elections. Now we have an improved situation in the sense that the European Parliament has more power, but this is still nowhere near enough. And we also can see that not in the forthcoming elections as well, that not that many people will be bothered to go and vote. So we we should learn um, the, to be self-critical in also other ways from this um, populist movements, and that's how we could probably uh, battle against xenophobia as well. Thank you, Emilia, the other panelists. Um, I think we still have some time um, to open up the discussion. Um, if any of you might want to comment on what we've talked here today or ask anything uh, of our three panelists, um, Please raise your hand or raise your blue or orange flag or anything. Um, feel free.
Yeah, you go. Hi. Hi, my name is uh, Anfi Ahren. I'm from uh, Assembly General of Czech Finland, Europa Nord. Uh, I would uh, short like to ask, uh, ask an answer from the panelists to an um, interesting question. Uh, what do you see as the difference between patriotism and nationalism? What is your answer? What is the difference or is there? Thank you. Thank you for your question, Mikko. To begin with, uh, nationalism uh, belongs into the top two ideologies of all times with re religion. So, uh, patriotism that doesn't. Uh, in Soviet Union, especially uh, during the Stalin time, uh, there, 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 there were right kind of uh, patriots and, and wrong kinds of patriots. The patriots against the cosmopolitans. Uh, so, the Soviet patriotism, that, that's uh, one way to speak of patriotism. But uh, all these uh, concepts, of course, are concepts that don't, they don't have a fixed meaning. They are concepts that are fought for. And there's all the time going on this definitional struggle, people are trying to say patriotism is this, nationalism is this. And it depends on the context. There, there are uh, times and places when nationalism has been a very progressive thing uh, when thought of what was happening in, in history. But, uh, and perhaps we should still fight that, that, that <coughs> we could have a different kind of nationalism that wouldn't be an exclusive nationalism, saying that only those who were born or who look uh, like somebody can belong to the nation. Perhaps we should have an inclusive nationalism. Perhaps uh, the whole term of nationalism should be robbed back from the nationalists. But uh, as long as uh, this hasn't happened, maybe patriotism is, is kind of a uh, nationalism light. <laughs> the easier way to speak about some, let's say, positive things. Even though when Neil was speaking, I, I thought that uh, you linked proud and identity very strong together. I don't know about my Finnish identity, if I'm so often proud about that. Quite often I have to say I'm quite ashamed of it. But, but, so, but we should be able to historize, like, like try to see that uh, whatever we are, us are always also the others for somebody else. And maybe inside the discourses of patriotism, this happens easier than inside the discourses of nationalism. Right, Neil or Amelia? Thank you, sir. Andy asked a very good question there, and it's the sort of question that academics and universities live for, because they could spend three to four hours here discussing it, and ultimately, <laughs> well, they, they turn off the lights in four hours, so. and ultimately, they're all right and they're all wrong, and that's the whole issue. Personally, I do believe there is a very strong difference between patriotism and nationalism today. And I suppose it's the extent to which you use each of them. Being a nationalist, does that mean you believe that your country, the, ident the country that you identify, your nation, is somehow better than others? Being a patriot, do you accept other countries are equal, but you have an undying uh, pride and also loyalty towards yours? It's one that you could debate for hours and hours, there's a, a very small saying, I'll say in Ireland, when discussing um, our peace process and the, the, the kind of the civil war in the 70s and 80s, Republicans use bombs, nationalists use guns, and patriots use poems. Is that how we're going to define it? Maybe they're the degrees of the, the emotion. Um, it is a very really good, good question, of course we could continue for hours on this, but but uh, I worry about this, the, these things quite often because, uh, for instance, in Hungary, um, you, would, you would have two sides, one of them claiming to be a nationalist and one of them claiming to be a patriot and they would be just fighting over the same things. And then there would be another problem that uh, something that is um, quite exclusive and nationalist and expansivist and uh, something like that, uh, quite boring, even xenophobic, uh, would be just called patriotism in order to legitimate that. So, I, 
I'm a researcher, so I would be looking into the, the context and references of those uh, terms always. I can't really go and say, uh, give a definition now. I just want you be, to be really reflexive about these terms and their usage and always kind of raise your eyebrows when you hear either of those terms. Dear panelists, thank you very much for your time and your uh, interesting comments. Um, the audience, thank you for participating and being patient with us. Um, I do hope you you stay and follow the later discussions as well. Uh, but right now, I thank you and, and wish you all a very nice Tuesday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.